Tonight, it's our 50th episode, and the guys are celebrating with an in-depth interview with MacGyver creator Lee Davids Lodhoff. Will Sam, Mike, and Jeff get canceled once Lee realizes the arena of absurdity he stumbled into? Find out next on Making Fun of MacGyver. It's Making Fun of MacGyver, a rib-tickling takedown of our favorite 80s adventure show, Remington Steel. No, it's MacGyver, starring Sam Jordan as the skeptic, Mike Garland as the diehard, and Jeff Hess as the scientist. Name's MacGyver. Welcome, everybody, to Making Fun of MacGyver, the show where we recap, review, and lovingly ridicule every episode of the original series. My name is Sam Jordan. I'm your host. And as usual, I'm joined by my two fellow MacGyverites, the five, Mike Garland. I have never been with a five, but I've been with two, two and a halfs at the same time. And the O, Jeff S. Hold on. I need to go back and figure out the last one. Trying to figure out my... Uh, it's the police thing. It's the five zero. Okay. Guys, I was, <laughs> I was counting up our back catalog the other day, and I was like, there must be 47. No, wait. There must be 48. No, wait. There must be 49. No, hang on a second. There must be 50... Episodes of Making Fun of MacGyver. 50... Episodes of Making Fun of MacGyver. You just slip out the back Congratulations, guys. This is our 50th episode. Uh, yeah. yeah. So happy, my, my, happy joy joy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> Glad you didn't hear tonight's clip. Um, <clears throat> but seriously, though, my halfway to 100 heartthrobs, I bring to you a most magnificent question. Are you prepared to interview the man who created the character who we created a show to make fun of? You know who thinks going to be interested in this? The woman who made the <laughs> podcast, making fun of the podcast that we made, making fun of the show. And this Mike, guy just created. a straight up yes, right? You would like to do that interview? Sure. I'd love to. Okay, great. Uh, because we're moments away from making fun of MacGyver. It's our 50th episode. And tonight we're sitting down with Lee Davids, Lodoff, writer, producer, director, and creator of MacGyver. But first, it's our opening gambit. Well, guys, we've done 50, and I think that's nifty. Ran an ad on Facebook last week promoting a very totally wholesome promo for our last episode. Um, you may have heard it or seen it. It was this one. Making fun of MacGyver. There you go, Pete. One ginger ale on ice. Uh, what's the matter? Oh, nothing. Nothing. It's fine. It's just the ginger ale is really best over shaved ice, not cubes. These are cubes. Will MacGyver shave Pete's cubes? Mac has been in a lot of sticky situations before, but has he ever shaved anyone's cubes? And if he does shave Pete's cubes, which of the 17 tools on his Swiss Army knife will he use? And isn't Pete a little old to still be shaving his cubes? Get the answers to these chilling questions on the heart-pounding episode out in the cold next time on Making Fun of MacGyver. One quick thought about that. If I uh, did have to use Swiss Army knife to shave a man's cubes, I think the scissors are the way to go. You know, Not the knife? Like, uh, well, because those knives are always dull. Uh, but you know, with the hmm. scissors, you can just get right to the cube right there like that and just like, uh, you know, just be careful. So we got total cover on that. We're just talking about shaving ice cubes, but I mistakenly, this is only our second Facebook ad. I sent out a Facebook ad. For some reason, it went only to people's messengers. I don't know how that works. It, it didn't pop up in their feed. It popped up in their messenger. And uh, some people weren't happy about that. <laughs> I targeted Minneapolis, the New York area, and the Vancouver area. I'm like, these people will like our stuff. So Eric Patterson uh, wrote to us. He said, how did this stupid stuff get on my <laughs> Facebook? <He> said, <laughs> hey, but you know what I love is that somehow 
Our, the Making Fun of MacGyver Facebook page came back as a bot, and it says, Hi, Eric, please let us know how we can help you. <laughs> <laughs> and then Manuel Tust, or Tusty, again, it says, Hi, Manuel, please let us know how we can help you. And he says, Don't text me anymore. That's how. So sweet. <laughs> Karen. <laughs> <laughs> and Manuel had one more thing to say. So Manuel says, Text me again, and I'll block you and tell everyone I know to block you. Good. He'll tell people oh. about us. <laughs> tell a friend, man. Well, about yeah. making fun of me. Like, let's. He tells ten people. Three of them block us. Seven of us are like, this is podcast. <laughs> okay, so let me just apologize to anyone that needs an apology. We didn't mean to get in your messenger feed, but whatever. We're still learning. <laughs> However, it did get us a couple of new fans. One of them on Facebook, Carlos uh, De Ole Polanco. So, Carlos, thank you. I, I'm pretty sure he's in the New York area. I'm pretty sure that's how he found us. And I'm going to give him a plug. It says, this guy apparently is a comic book artist. Because uh, on his Facebook page, it says, uh, let's welcome for the first time at the party, comic artist Carlos De Olio. Carlos is the creator of Exton, Ziston Comics, which focuses on his creator-owned Dominican characters, Blue Street and Flaming Jr. So check out those uh, comics. So appreciate you listening. And also, Michael W. out of Fairhaven, New Jersey, started following us on Twitter. So we got two people. <laughs> um, also, recent follower Joshua Ammon said he likes that we thank new followers on social media. That's something we do, you know, like we're doing now. Don't be so thirsty, Joshua. How's he thirsty? <laughs> he's thirsty for you to shout him out. He's like, I, I want to get a shout by one of these guys. Uh, so I gonna, don't know. Okay. He's going to humble brag his way. Too thirsty, Joshua. But... Joshua, it is easy to do when you get three to five new fans a month, as we do. The great thing about a podcast with a small following like ours is we can really give that extra TLC to every follower. So to that end, you know, I mentioned Michael W. uh, on Twitter at a Fairhaven. I'd just like to tell Michael W. uh, that if you're hearing this, Michael, just a reminder that registration is ongoing now for the Fairhaven Soccer Squirts. Uh, 50 minute sessions will be held at the Fairhaven Field on Sundays between April 24th and June 19th. The cost is $185. Go to fairhavennewjersey.org for more information. Wow. Solid plug. <laughs> if you like our brand of shenanigans, we'd love it if you engaged or it helped us uh, promote the show. We do a lot of stuff on uh, Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, post a lot of funny skits and bits there. Follow us there. Say hi. A rating or a review would be awesome. If your podcast supplier allows for such a thing, please give us a rating or a review. You can leave a message for us on the Making Fun of MacGyver hotline. It's 904-419-3310. We'll play it back on the show. No one's going to pick up the phone. We won't talk to you, but just take about 60 seconds or less and uh, just tell us what you want to talk about. You know, review an episode, make fun of Making Fun of MacGyver, do whatever. And if email is your thing, MakingFunOfMacGyver at gmail.com. And if you want monthly bonus episodes, a video chat hangout session, and your own seat as a co-host for an episode with us, go to Patreon.com slash MakingFunOfMacGyver for the details. Now, if you listen to the show, you know we've got this viewer mail segment that comes up right about now. And yes, we call it viewer mail, even though we're a podcast and no one is really viewing us. And it has a theme, and we borrowed it from the old Late Show with David Letterman. And for whatever reason, we have this running gag where we add a second of the theme, of the repetitive string hits, uh, add a second more onto each show. Last week, it was approximately 35 seconds. And I think we all agree, a little obnoxious. I had an opportunity to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Since we're about to interview a veteran Hollywood writer and producer and the man who created MacGyver, it's a very high-profile moment for us. I'm thinking this is the episode where we finally have to push it to 36 seconds. <laughs> Too short. It's still too short for you, Jeff? Seems like it. <laughs> I'm, I'm fairly numb to the concept at this point. It's, <laughs> it's become white noise. 
<laughs> yes, exactly. Just people are going to start going to sleep to this. Uh, all right. One letter this week. Stacy in Virginia writes, Hey, guys, I'm trying to hit MacGyver the Musical next week. Sorry to hear you guys won't be seeing MacGyver the Musical. I was enjoying imagining the three of you in your fanciest suits with playbills in hand. Maybe next year? Uh, I think it's admirable that she thinks I own a suit. I own a suit. Sometimes it fits. Sometimes it doesn't. So, yes, uh, when you hear this, the final show of MacGyver the Musical will have concluded its run, I believe. But uh, we didn't get there this year, but maybe next year. We're hoping. Yeah, we really did. We wanted to be there. Um, I heard the reviews are really great. And uh, I'm just not so sure about the whole choosing the MacGyver from the audience each night. I don't think I want to be that you didn't person. like You didn't like that idea? Choosing the MacGyver? They choose the MacGyver out of the audience every night. I thought it was a great idea. And not only that, when we thought we were maybe going to go, I was, I was actually really ready for them to call on me. You had a plan? Hold up. No, you weren't. No, you weren't. Yeah. No, you were not ready. No, no, There's no, no. no way you can be ready for such a well, thing. Well, I was ready. I, I even had a song picked out and everything. Oh, boy. No, you didn't. No, I totally had a song. I'm not kidding. You want to hear it? I don't think we have a choice. So you're going to make us hear it, aren't you? I am. I am. But listen, check this out. I am not firing a single shot. I am not firing a single shot. Hey, yo, I love to serve my country, but I'll only do it gun free. I am not firing a single shot. I'm a man and much duct tape now i probably shouldn't brag but all i need to escape any problem is my brains and my science knowledge what's made a robot from a donut loose wires and uh, some shoe polish i'm a mullet rocking dude as brilliant as i'm bold trying to break the mold my powers you'll see as they unfold i'm only 35 but my mind is stronger these worldwide conflicts grow longer they'll haunt you every bad guy though no no i've learned you can't fight don't even own a gun to bang right so i hang tight and dodge the bullets like i dodge the fame but damn this song is getting long so let me tell you my name, I am the M-A-C-G-Y-V-E-R on TV, you see, I was the star. Whether I'm giving Pete some flack, clack, or teaming up with Jack, Jack, I'll find a way to save the day in 60 minutes flat, flat. I'm known for my skills with my trusty pocket knife, and the stick of gum beats a trigger thumb, oh yes, that's right. And though I excel, there's one guy who gives me hell. I can't even open the word doc without seeing Murdoch. Take a my MacGyver! Yep, that's him, I'm not a fan, but hey, that's my life. So now I think you understand that when the shit hits the fan, and you need a leading man forget the bombs in the arms i got an impromptu plan i'm not firing a single shot i am not firing a single shot ayo i'd love to serve my country but i'll only do a gun free i am not firing a single shot sing he is not firing a single shot he is not firing a single shot ayo we love to serve his country but i'll only do a gun free he is not firing a single shot Yeah, so that's what I was going to do. Either that or like Seasons of Love from Rent and maybe change it to like Seasons of MacGyver, but it just didn't seem as catchy. So I think you nailed it. All right, let's get to it, shall we? Uh, even if you're not familiar with his face or voice, you've seen his name on the credits of MacGyver for decades, be it the original Mac or the 2016 reboot. He's written MacGyver books, graphic novels, and musicals because he is the man who created MacGyver. And a couple of days ago, uh, Lee David Zlodoff was gracious enough to sit down with us for a wide-ranging chat about his upbringing, his career, and how MacGyver was created, how it was canceled in 2021, and even what he thinks of our silly show. So we hope you enjoy listening to it as much as we enjoyed taking part in it. Well, right now, we are thrilled and honored to be joined by writer, producer, director, and creator of MacGyver, Mr. Lee David Zlodoff. Welcome, Lee. Thank you. It's fun to be here. <laughs> uh, it is, first of all, right off the bat, why are you letting us do this? Why um, have you let us made a, make up a show called Making Fun of MacGyver for the past two years, and you have not sent one single cease and desist email to our inboxes? Why? What, what's wrong with you? Well, number one, um, I'm hoping to convince you to change the name of the show <laughs> to making or having fun with MacGyver from making fun of MacGyver, but I may fail in that, but that was my initial reason for saying yes, number one. And number two, because MacGyver kind of belongs to everybody, you know? It's really not, I mean, yes, I own the rights to a crazy story, but, 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 um, but I didn't make MacGyver a global phenomenon. You guys did, everybody else did, people did. 
And so when people come to me and say, hey, we like MacGyver, we love MacGyver, would you be willing to talk to us about it? I go, absolutely, why not? You know, he's uh, certainly now more than ever, we have to MacGyver things and we have to use that mindset because the world has been turned upside down and all the things that we thought we could just take for granted, all those chains and all those systems, be they power grids or, you know, internet, or they're just not as robust as we, we would like them to be. So, you know, if there was ever a time for MacGyver, man, this is it. Well, we appreciate the, in advance, the generosity, and we appreciate not getting those emails over the last two years. And another reason maybe why you haven't, you know, uh, raised any cane is maybe you haven't listened to the show. And if you haven't listened to the show, you know what? You're fine. You really don't need to. <laughs> I'm just going to say, just keep it up. <laughs> but, um, but either way, uh, we thank you for being here. Um, let's, we're going to obviously get into your backstory and the history of MacGyver and everything, but let's start with like the hottest news in MacGyver verse, which is the musical, um, MacGyver the musical. And we're recording this on February 19th, 2022. And the musical's been running for about two weeks in Houston, Texas now. So how's it going? What can fans expect? Just like tell, give us a, the update on MacGyver the musical. Okay, so um, so it is it is doing extremely well. Um, uh, we have gotten a rave review from the Houston Chronicle, um, and we are getting more or less standing ovations every night because one of the unique aspects of this show is that we cast the lead role of MacGyver out of the audience in every performance, okay? So it's like, how more MacGyver could you get than taking somebody from the audience and saying, you're going to MacGyver your way through this musical. And so nobody ever knows what's going to happen from performance to performance because it's not about making a perfect show. It's about, can this person rise to the occasion and figure out how to get through this musical. Obviously, we help them. We have cue cards. We have other you know, devices that we use. But the fun of the show is, what if the star was just one of you people? Okay? And it's a hoot. I mean, it's a hoot. It's, it's just plain fun. Um, so it's doing very well. It'll run through the first week in March, I think. Um, and then we are going to start gearing up to do two things. Uh, we're going to, I think, do a concept album for the show so that people can hear the songs even before they get to go to the musical. And then we're in the process of looking for the right city and the right venue to, uh, to do uh, our first commercial production. Because Stages Theater in Houston is a nonprofit theater. So, okay. yeah. With regards to the musical itself... You wrote it. What's been your overall level of involvement? So I actually wrote it with uh, some other young people, a team of young writers, uh, Kate Chavez, Robin Holloway, and uh, Lindsay uh, Perlman. Um, and the music and lyrics are done by a guy out of New York named Peter Lurie, who has never written a musical before. He actually comes out of children's television. And... Um, so I am, I would say, deeply involved both on a producing level and on a writing level. But, you know, this is this was sort of my brainchild. And so, you know, I'm doing my best to kind of nurture it and let it go at the same time. <laughs> That's not always easy to do. You know, it's like, hey, Dad, I want to ride a bike. No, you can't do that. <laughs> there are cars out there. <laughs> so, so, but you got to go sooner or later. Eh, they got to learn how to ride a bike, you know, and. So that's that's a process. And obviously, I've been in film and television for my entire professional career, and I've never done anything like this before. So it's kind of just a fun learning experience for me because, trust me, theater is a very different animal than film and television, as I learn on a daily basis. You mentioned the, the, the concept album and a commercial production. Do you plan to try to tour at all, or what's the end game for this? Yeah, so I think what we're going to do, um, we're not particularly looking to like license the show. So, you know, have a theater say, hey, we, we want to do a production, you know, we'll just do our own production. More, Think of it more as 
Blue Man Group or Cirque du Soleil. So we'll go to a place and we'll set it up. And so long as it's doing well there, we'll leave it there. And then maybe we'll go to another place and set it up somewhere else uh, or move it from city to city. So again, we're just kind of learning the ropes in this, but, but it's more like we'd rather do it, do it right than just you know, sell it off to somebody and let them do whatever they want with it. So that's kind of the vision for it at the moment. And, you know, because MacGyver is a global phenomenon, we fully anticipate that this is going to go international at some point. I mean, believe it or not, Korea loves American musicals (laughs) and every pocket knife in Korea is called a MacGyver. Okay, they don't pronounce it that way. I can't pronounce it the way they pronounce it. But every pocket knife in Korea is called a MacGyver. So, okay, you love MacGyver, you love musicals. I have a feeling this is going to end up in Korea someday. But it could certainly go to London and Berlin and, you know, because MacGyver is loved all over the world. So there's a long vision for this, and it'll obviously take time to get there. But so what? Well, best of luck with, with all of this. It's really cool to to watch the, the growth of your creation. Listen, again, you know, I had no idea when I created MacGyver that it was going to turn into what it turned into, okay? And I got to give credit to Richard Dean Anderson and the writers and the producers and the crew and the actors. I mean, they brought this thing to life. I kind of gave them a blueprint and, and you know, they, they turned it into this phenomenon. And obviously enough so that it, it spawned another TV series, okay? And so... And through a crazy mix-up back in the early 90s, it turned out that I ended up owning all the rights. So it was like, okay. So now we have, you know, a MacGyver.com website. There are several books. There's a nonfiction book. There's a fiction series that we're going to probably publish the second book of sometime a little later this year. And, you know, and it's like, okay, and why not do a musical? Yeah, why not? You know, of course, when I went to people and said, oh, well, we want the lead to be cast out of the audience, they went, you're out of your mind. And I went, good. Now I know we're on the right track. <laughs> nice, nice. So let's let's see how you got to that point, though. Let's let's learn more about you. And we're talking with Lee David's Lodoff, writer, producer, director, and creator of MacGyver. So, um, born safe to say, I, I see you went to school. You started school in New York, but were you born in New York or? Yes, I was born in I was born in Brooklyn. The first part of my life, I was raised in Long Island, a place called West Hempstead. When I was about eleven or twelve, we moved to Rockaway Queens, which is where I learned to surf. Go figure. Um, And then I went to high school at at what was then one of the four specialized high schools in New York. I think there are six, I don't know, maybe there's seven or eight specialized high schools. But I went to Brooklyn Technical High School, which was then not a co-ed school. Now it's co-ed school. Then it was simply all boys. So there were, you know, like, I think it was 6,000 boys in in this high school. And um, my graduating class was like 1,200 people, you know, and it was crazy. But... It was, it was a great education, and it was there were technical aspects. Originally, Brooklyn Tech had been founded so that people could go right from high school into industry. Um, but obviously, by the time I got there, even though you took wood shop, machine shop, foundry, eight terms of mechanical drawing, you know, I don't know how many people need mechanical drawing these days, but. Um, but I was going there just because it was a good college preparatory school, so. So did your parents plant any seeds as far as the writing, entertainment, you know, bug that was in you? Or did it come? When did that come to you? When did you know you wanted to kind of write for television or be in the industry? Um, that came in college, although I was always a storyteller and I was always writing little stories. They neither discouraged me or <laughs> encouraged me. You know, my parents were both school teachers. Um, and, and so... Uh, But it was when I went to uh, college and I went to this very unique school called St. John's College, which uh, is not the university in Queens, is is a small liberal arts school um, and uh, has a campus in in Santa Fe, New Mexico and one in uh, Annapolis, Maryland. And um, that was easily one of the most transformative experiences of my life because uh, St. John's So let's talk about education just for a second, okay? Most education 
even higher education in this country is we stuff you full of information, we exam you, in which case you regurgitate that information. If you've done it well enough, we give you a grade, okay? And then you promptly forget that information and go learn information from somebody else, okay? Well, guess what? You could push a button now and get more information than you know what to need. Oh, Google. Yes, I look for this thing. Oh, here's 2,999 references to that. <laughs> At St. John's College, it's not about information. You read and discuss the great books of the Western world, but the purpose of that is not to become a great book scholar. The purpose of that is to learn how to speak, to learn how to listen, to learn how to write, and to learn how to think for yourself. Because all the courses are, are small, it's a very small school, maybe 450 students on each campus, um, and they're all seminars, they're all discussions, okay? And in that process of reading these books and talking about them and pounding your head against things that at first glance seem incomprehensible, you begin to understand how to learn anything. And so when you leave this school, you have this amazing skill set. You don't necessarily have a specific body of knowledge. Oh, I'm a biologist or I'm a, you know, I'm a mathematician, but you now know how to learn any subject. And so instead of my education becoming more obsolete as I got older, my education becomes more valuable because you have to pivot in life these days and knowing how to pivot and say, oh, now I got to learn this skill set or now I got to learn how to code or now I got to learn whatever. Mm -hmm. It turns out it proved to be a remarkably valuable education. And I would say I owe much of my um, you know, professional success to being able to look at something, whether it's a book or a movie or the whole Hollywood system and say, how does this really work? Okay, and what is the best way to navigate this system? And that really came from my experience at St. John's. So, well, I would assume they've given you many a uh, honorary degree, but if if, if not, yeah. after hearing that speech, I mean, they should they, there should be a plaque, a, a statue. But that's a great <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like that's kind of where you see um, you know the future of maybe writing writing for television or just becoming a writer and then how do how do you how does it translate into i know the doctors that pseudo soap opera is one of your first gigs writing but how do you get from college to writing for television right so it was in at st john's and i'm thinking okay what do i want to do with my life and i kind of said well where are the next great books coming from i mean i'm reading this you know, the sort of development of Western thought, okay? And I went, you know, what's really creating thought in the world is film and television. So I'd be curious to go into that and to see where that takes me. And so I wrote a couple of scripts on my own um, and was lucky enough to, you know, get them in front of some agents in New York and they went, I'm not going to represent you, but you obviously can write, okay? So... P.S. I managed to get my job, myself a job as a secretary on that soap opera, The Doctors. And then uh, one day, for a variety of reasons, I thought, you know, I didn't come here to be a secretary. So I ended up having a chat with the producer of the show. And I said, you know, I think I can write the show better than it's being written. And he went, well, that's a pretty cocky thing for a secretary to say. I thought, what the hell? Worse than happens, he's going to fire me. And... Um, and so he said, you got anything to back that up? And I said, well, yeah, here's one of my scripts. I figured he'll throw it in the garbage or he'll come in the next day and he'll can me or, you know, it's like I got nothing to lose. So so the next morning he comes in and he walks through the, you know, the bullpen and he looks at me. He goes, you in my office now. And I go, oh, boy, here it comes. OK. <laughs> and he goes, I walk in. He goes, close the door. I said, OK, I'll close the door. He says, sit down, sit down. He says, I read your script last night. I went, really? He goes, yeah, and you're right. You got a job as a writer. That's how I got my first job. <laughs> I was promptly fired as a secretary by my superior, but it didn't matter. This producer of the show just gave me a job as a writer. So I said, like, all right, let's do this. So I wrote soap operas for a year, which was a very learning experience. One of the things I learned is I didn't want to be a soap opera writer, but it paid me 
an astonishing amount of money. I was 22 years old living in Greenwich Village and making $3,000 a week. You know, that's still a lot of money. But back then, it was huge. Um, but but I wasn't, it, it wasn't ultimately the kind of writing that I wanted to do. So, um, so after about a year, I just sort of moved on. And, uh, and then probably within the next six months, I relocated to Los Angeles because I just thought at that time, uh, my wife at the time was pregnant. And I thought, you know, I don't really want to raise a child in New York City. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but, you know, it just wasn't my vision of being a parent. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, let's go out to Hollywood uh, I'd rather find a suburb out there and, and raise uh, our child there. I, I did not know a soul in Hollywood. I knew absolutely nobody. But I thought, well, it worked out in New York. How hard can it be in Hollywood? And sure enough, worked out okay. So you have involvement then with Hill Street Blues and Remington Steel writing for those particular programs. Can you share some stories and, and how you got involved there and your experience with those programs? Yeah, so I, I met um, I met a producer uh, of uh, Hill Street Blues, or we were friends before that, and then he, he got a job producing Hill Street Blues. And so I wrote a spec script um, for them. Well, or we kind of wrote a script together. I'm not. I don't remember exactly. And then, um, and and then I got a, a an opportunity to write for a show called Brett Maverick with James Garner. Not the original half hour show, but they were bringing it back in an hour version. And in the same week, I was offered a job by Hill Street Blues and and Brett Maverick. And I took the Brett Maverick job. One of the biggest mistakes of my career. <laughs> Because Hill Street Blues went on to be this iconic television show, but it was a learning experience, as all things were. And um, and I turns out I had the ability to write um, very fairly polished scripts in very short periods of time. Um, and and that, believe it or not, that story is kind of contained in the MacGyver secret book that I wrote, which is the nonfiction book, which is a methodology that I kind of stumbled upon of tapping directly into your subconscious, which turns out to be the real creator in you or the real problem solver in you, not your conscious mind. Who knew? Okay, but I just discovered that. And so um, so I was able to move up the ranks of television very quickly. So I started as a, you know, a freelancer, and then I was a story editor, and then I was a supervising producer. And the next thing you knew, I was okayed by all three networks to write pilots. It's like, and that happened in a very, I mean, like two years, okay, because I could just crank out those scripts and, and a producer, the exec, you know, head of the show would look at it and go, instead of this being a page one rewrite for me, I can polish this script in three hours and send it to production, you know, pay this guy whatever he wants, give him any title, we don't care, just throw meat in there and just let him keep putting scripts out. So I was very fortunate in that regard and... Um, and that also gave me the opportunity. I say, listen, I turned in my script and they go, really? It's done already? And I go, yeah. So can I go like hang out in the editing room and see what they do there? Can I go to the stage and watch what they do there? Can I sit in casting sessions? And so I really wrote myself, you know, kind of up the ladder because they wanted to keep me happy. So they said, sure, sit in casting. Sure, go to the stage for a while. Sure, go to the editing room. By the way, when's your next script coming in? Next week, no problem. You know, it's like, all right, great. There you go. Very cool. So the MacGyver origin story. Everybody that listens to our podcast, anybody that knows the brand MacGyver has to wonder, how did it start? Where, when, how does the concept of MacGyver come to you? Okay, um, so, so this is detailed, by the way, on the MacGyver.com website. You can go find the origin story. It's, it's whole things written out because this is the question I'm asked more than any other question. <laughs> so usually in television, you come up with an idea, you try and go sell it. That was not this situation. Uh, Henry Winkler's company in Paramount um, had sold an idea to the network, okay? And they wanted a writer for it. And um, 
for a variety of reasons, I was approached to be the writer of this thing. And they kept saying to me, this concept has never been done before. The network is incredibly excited. And I went, awesome, that sounds great. Okay, and then we made a deal for me to write this pilot. First pilot I had ever written, okay. And they bring me in and they sit me down and they tell me the concept. And I listen and I ask a couple of questions. And then I said, hmm. They said, is there a problem? And I said, well, you know, there's a reason this has never been done before. <laughs> they said, what's that? I said, it's not going to work. And they went, what do you mean? The network loved it. And I said, yeah, that's because nobody in the room was the one who actually had to figure out how to do it. And they had a show called Hourglass. And they wanted one hour of real time to be one hour of television time. Okay. And I said, oh, so you want a serial, i.e. what 24 ultimately became. Okay. And they said, no, 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 it can't be a serial. The foreign buyers don't want serials. They want standalone episodes. And I said, oh, so, so you need a beginning, a middle, and end in each one hour, which is one hour of real time. They went, yeah, isn't that great? And I said, I said, yeah, see, you just gave away the ability to jump space and time, which is one of the crucial values in film and television. You know, you're in New York, you see a plane for two seconds. You're in Beijing and it's two days later, you know? You gave that up. You just handed that off. Our guy can't go anywhere. He It has to begin where it ends because you don't want to see this person traveling. You want to see him doing things. <laughs> right. They went, well, what do you mean? And I said, okay, you got the bank vault show. You got the sinking submarine show. You got the mine shaft show. You see where I'm going with this, guys? I said, "This you're going to choke on this. And so I went home and I thought, well, they'll probably fire me. That's okay. You know, I wasn't, you know, they, they came to me. I wasn't going looking for a pilot. Um, and, you know, I felt a little bad. Nobody wants, you know, nobody wants to hear their baby is ugly. I understand that. But I thought I can't morally, I mean, I could write that pilot, but I knew this isn't going to work as a TV show. And really you're hiring me to give you something that's going to last for at least five years, right? So I went, I know I did the right thing. Maybe it wasn't the right career move. And then I get a call. It's like, okay. And I end up meeting Henry Winkler. And they basically say, well, we're not going to fire you. And we're not going to unsell the show. So you got to fix this. So I go, okay. So I came up with one idea, went to the network. No. Another idea, went to the network. No. Another idea, went to the network. No. And I went, okay. I was just supposed to write this thing. I thought this idea was already sold. I could be pitching this for the rest of my life. So I called all my writer friends, got them to my office, had every inebriant one could possibly want, and said, we're not leaving this room till I got a great idea to get me out of this deal because, you know, I, I'm, I don't know where to go. And they said, well, what do you got? So I shared everything that I had pitched at the networks, and I said, I got nothing. That's why you're here. I don't know where to go anymore. I'm, I'm lost. And there was this long pause. I don't even remember which one of my friends said it, and they went, okay, great, let's go with that. I said, let's go with what? They said, let's go with nothing. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> they said, well, you know, James Bond, he gets all those toys from Q at the beginning of the movie, and Indiana Jones, he's got the hat and the gun and the whip. What if our guy has nothing? And it was this long pause, and I thought, that's it? We send our action-adventure hero into a situation, and he's got nothing. He's got to make it up and figure it out along the way. I thought, that's exactly what this show is about, because we just took nothing and turned it into something. And because I thought, well, where's the hook going to be? I thought, what if we don't let him use a gun? If you take the gun away, then he's going to have to figure out things every week to get himself out of a jam, to beat the bad guys, whatever it is. And I get, there's your hook. People are going to tune in and say, well, what's he going to come up with this week? Because he can't just shoot back like every other action adventure hero in history does. So, and then, of course, my dad, when I was 10 years old, 11 years old, gave me a Swiss Army knife and said, you keep this with you. It's the best tool you'll ever have. So... 
to this day, I have a Swiss Army knife in my pocket, except when I travel on airplanes because they take them away. Um, and, uh, and so I said, great, let's give him a Swiss Army knife. I don't remember when the duct tape showed up, but, you know, same thing. It's like Swiss Army knife and duct tape. Boy, there's not a lot you can't do. Really, there's not a lot you can't do. That's how MacGyver got created. So, and then the name... We were pitching this around, and I and so my friends then said, "Well, what are you going to call it?" And I said, "We kept saying our guy this and our guy that. Why don't guys just call it Guy?" <laughs> and they went, "No, no, that's a little on the nose, don't you think?" And I said, "No, okay." At that time, you may remember McDonald's used to put on their signs how many hamburgers they had sold. You know, like 50 million sold, 100 million sold. At some point, I think they decided we should stop doing this because people's going to start translating it back into cows. Like, how many cows is you know a billion hamburgers? <laughs> But anything that was wildly popular got a Mac in front of it. So USA Today came out. It was called Mac Newspaper. Okay. So I said, great, let's call him Mac Guy. And they went, nah, it's got to be three syllables. So I went, Guy, Guy. Oh, how about Guy Ver? That's kind of a Scottish name. They're known for being flinty and frugal. MacGyver, they went, yeah, we like that. Yeah, go in with that, Lee. So I went in with that and this idea of a guy who just had to figure it out. As he went along, and the and the network said, "Oh, you know, we like this idea. I said, fabulous! I wrote that script in like record time <laughs> before anybody could change their mind." The next thing I know, I get a call from Henry Winkler. They're making the pilot. I went, "Wow!" So, rest is history, guys. That is that is awesome, and and we're talking with Lee David Zlodoff, creator of MacGyver, and that right there is. The origin story of the character MacGyver, and you can also check it out in text form at MacGyver.com. That's the website, correct? Yep. But, but I mean, you, you couldn't have said it better yourself because, well, it's your story. So we, we appreciate you sharing that one. Oh, my goodness. That's great. It's really awesome to hear. It's just, it's slightly surreal, you know, just to hear how this iconic character was created and just the process. And he, talking to the creator, I mean, just thank you again for, uh, for sharing that. One of the things you take away from that, that whole MacGyver mindset is like, you know what? The resources you need to solve a problem are probably right around you and or inside you if you just stop and take a look. And I went, okay, I'm lost. Let me gather my friends and say, what can we do here? And out of that conversation came this iconic character and television series. And you sort of go, See, it's all there, you know? So what a lot of people may not know, as we didn't, and this might explain why you wouldn't be too angry about us teasing the original MacGyver TV show, (laughs) is that you created, of course, the character, but then I guess you chose not to stay with the show? That is correct. For a variety of reasons, um, uh, I had been on Remington Steel and and wasn't particularly happy at a certain point, so I I left mid-second season uh, of Remington Steel, and, and then I wrote MacGyver, and I decided that for whatever reason, I had a young family at that time. I mean, I ultimately had four children, okay? And I said, you know, writing for another series is, it's, it's, it takes an enormous chunk of your life. And I just didn't want to do that at that point. I really wanted to spend time with my kids. And I knew, again, maybe not the wisest career move, but... You know, there's there's money and career and there's life. And sometimes I said, no, I think I'm going to choose life and the money career will be what they'll be. But, you know, I didn't need a billion dollars and I didn't, didn't need to be Steven Spielberg. And, you know, I mean, God bless them all. But not, you know, you only get you only get to have a young family once, hopefully. So. Yeah. So you create the character. You, you choose to not be involved with the TV show, but of course your name is at the you know the front of every episode, just like Bob Kane with Batman and all people like that. So how much attention do you give that show over the years? Do you kind of just like say I, I don't even want to see what they're doing, or do you watch as the man whose baby has now been adopted by someone else, and you're very curious to see what they do with that baby? Yeah, I would say um, I probably watched most of the episodes sooner or later. I didn't. I sort of didn't dote on it, you know, but I didn't ignore it. Um, it was just, and again, I, I had no idea what it was going to become, 
you know, I thought, well, great, I'm glad. And then eventually, you know, it went seven seasons. Well, they wanted five. They got seven. I did my job. You know, I gave them a blueprint that would work. Um, but, you know, the way I think about MacGyver is, you know, you have a child. The child goes out in the world and does something wonderful. Are you proud? Of course you're proud. But you can't say it's mine. You know, it, they did it. So, so I, I have a certain ownership of MacGyver, but I don't. I don't take credit for it, if you understand what I mean. It's, it, it did it itself, you know. Again, Richard Dean Anderson, writers, producers, actors, directors, they brought it to life. And obviously that combination of elements just caught fire in some way. And of course I'm proud, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't take credit for it in a sense of, oh, look what I did. I was like, okay. I did it. Great. I had this child and the child grew up and, you know, saw you cured cancer. Fabulous, you know, but I didn't cure cancer. So I, I think we actually think that might be one of MacGyver's character traits. He he can teach uh, foreign children to speak English. He <laughs> can fix damn near anything. Um, are there any traits? Uh, real question. Are there any traits that you wish you would have added to the character that you didn't upon its original creation? Hmm. That's a good question. I don't think so. I mean, again, you know, we kind of break it down on a website. It's like, you didn't use a gun. Avoid conflict because nine times out of 10, conflict just leads to more conflict. Because in conflict, even if you win, you made an enemy and that enemy is looking to get back, okay? Number two, you know, how do you turn what you have into what you need, all right? which right now is something we're all dealing with, as we mentioned before. And the third thing was MacGyver had a sense of humor and humility. No matter how um, intractable or life-threatening the situation was, he was always able to keep a sense of humor and humility. And it turns out that a laughing and open mind is a lot more likely to come up with a good solution than a frightened or angry mind. So... It went, you know, these are really turned out to be sort of the MacGyver core values, for want of a better term. And they're pretty good core values if you think about it going forward. We are, I mean, we have been moving into a new reality even before this pandemic hit. And this pandemic just made it very clear to us, okay? We are all in this together. You Countries can fight each other all they want, but the end, at the end of the day, the house is still on fire. We've got a major climate crisis. We've got, you know, serious challenges with food and water and energy and health care. And we're either going to find a way to solve this as a civilization or we're not going to survive as a civilization. I mean, so you take the core values of MacGyver and you say, maybe these are management tools for this century. Because we get this century right, this thing that we call civilization with, you know, electric cars and cell phones and all that cool stuff, it has a future. We don't get this century right. I'm not so sure that's the case. You know, we are in an existential moment right now. Is this civilization going to survive or isn't it? And it's up to all of us. It's not, you know, we can look to the leaders of the countries, but you and I both don't. They're not going to solve the problem. It's us humans who are going to solve mm -hmm. the problem, however we choose to do it. And we can do it. We created the problem. We can solve the problem. Okay. And so now we got to MacGyver the world, boys and girls. Hate to be so blunt about it, but there it is. We MacGyver the world. We got a future. So you created the character MacGyver. I think we've covered that in, in some detail here. Are there any other creator, uh, any other characters, I should say, uh, that you've created and uh, anything even kind of like Mac that maybe you've done? One of the curious things about my career is usually when you do something and it's successful, they want to keep hiring you to do sort of the same kind of thing. And and I chose not to do that. You know, it's like, oh, let's get Lee Zlodoff to write this thing because he knows how to write this. And then it's like, let's get somebody like Lee Zlodoff to write this thing because that's the kind of thing he did. And then it's like, who's Lee Zlodoff, mm -hmm. you know? And I was never interested in just kind of being pigeonholed. So I never wrote another action-adventure character. Um, and the things I went on to do, I made a little movie called The Spitfire Grill, which ended up winning the Audience Award at the Sundance Film Festival, and then was turned into a musical. I didn't turn it into a musical. Somebody else turned it into a musical. And it's been 
one of the top 10 most successful musicals in the United States when it started in, I think, 2001. Since then, there's been something like 700, 800, you know, productions of this musical. So I'm good at creating what I call indelible characters, but they're not necessarily action adventure heroes. The main character of, of that um, movie, which was an indie film, was, you know, a young woman from Appalachia. Um, and so I can't really point to anything else that I've done that's kind of like MacGyver because I kind of made a choice not to keep doing the, the same thing again and again. I mean, I've worked on other television series and some of science fiction and, you know, kind of all over the map, but I wasn't, I was more interested in doing things that spoke to me for some reason than worrying about what, how is this going to work in my career, you know? And again, maybe that was wise, maybe that was unwise, but that's just who I am. So, Yeah, the Spitfire Grill, it was actually uh, on our list here to talk about next, 1996 drama. Um, you know, we haven't seen it, but yeah, there did, did seem to be some real good critical acclaim there. And especially for a guy that creates MacGyver, the subject matter about a woman, I, I believe, coming out of prison and adapting to a new way of life and really seems like a, almost a 180 from an actual adventure guy, if that's what you were going to be pigeonholed as. But what was that experience like for you? And I, I believe that's your only major motion picture, you know, writing and directing. So that is another one of your babies out there, right? Didn't have the same legs as MacGyver. But what was that experience like for you? Well, that was an equally crazy story. So I was approached by some people who turned out to be a Catholic charity wanting to get into the low budget independent feature business and i said i'm not sure i'm your guy because you know i'm jewish and as far as you're concerned the time you know i belong to a congregation we would celebrate shabbat at my house i said i'm not a little jewish from your perspective i'm probably a lot jewish you know so they went no 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 it's okay we 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 don't want a religious film we want a beautiful character driven drama like tender mercies well, I love Tender Mercy. So I said, OK, maybe I could do something like that. And I said, but if I write it, I would want to direct it. That's kind of a, you know, that's the bottom line for me. And so they said, OK. And they had no story. So they had the money to make the movie. And again, usually you write a script and you go looking for the money to make the script. In this case, they had the money and no script. And so I, uh, I came up with an idea. Um, kind of using the MacGyver secret, for those of you who ever know what that is or bother to find out. Um, and uh, went to them and I said, this is, this is my idea for this story. And they said, great, go write it. And, and I, I wrote it and I thought, okay, they're a Catholic charity. They're going to have to take it to the you know, bishop and the provincial <laughs> and the, who knows, the Pope may have to <laughs> sign off on this. This could take you know, months, I have to pilot, another pilot to write for ABC, so great, whatever. So I uh, uh, FedEx the script off on a Wednesday. And I figured, okay, I got a month, probably more before I'm going to get any answer. Friday morning, they called me and said, we're making the movie. Wow. <laughs> wow. They had sent it to the guy, whoever was next up in the hierarchy uh, of, of their Catholic order, and he read the script and he said, I love this. Don't screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> so there was really no studio. I got to make this movie and really nobody was telling me what to do. I mean, I had, you know, a bond company and that kind of stuff. But but there was nobody above me who was saying it's got to be this. It's got to be that. So I had more or less complete creative freedom. And for better or for worse, it worked out pretty well. So... Would you call the 2016 Lucas Till version of MacGyver a reboot or reimagining? Because we want to we want to brand it properly. Is it a reboot or a reimagining? Well, I was um, I didn't have uh, really any creative input into that situation, um, and I thought I was disappointed a that they didn't initially reach out to Richard Dean and Anderson to see if he wanted to be involved. They sort of did subsequently, but by then I think they had kind of pissed them off. And and that um, 
and that they sort of dispensed with the universe and the history that the original series had created. They just sort of, so it was, I guess I would have to call it a reimagining because it was sort of the same essential character elements, but they had just come up with a whole new backstory for who he was and how he got there. And, and don't misunderstand me, I thought Lucas Till really did a great job. And I really liked that the cast was um, significantly female, multiracial, you know, um, um, uh, Meredith Seaton, um, who was uh, a major character in that. I mean, I thought this is really beautiful because this is really speaking now to, you know, what shows should be in this time period. So I, th I give them a lot of credit for that. I was glad they never put a gun in MacGyver's hands, but you know, for the first couple of seasons, George Eats was standing next to him and he shot everything in sight. You kind of go, well, that wasn't exactly the idea, guys. But like I said, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't mine from a creative standpoint to deal with at that point. So I went, well, you do what you want, see where it goes. I know a lot of the fans of the original series were not crazy about it when it came out, but it obviously found a following because it stayed on the air for five more seasons. So there you go. What were your thoughts on the fact that they did have original MacGyver cast members on the reimagining? Um, Bruce McGill, Michael DeBar, and even Elia Baskin, uh, who uh, two different occasions played Yuri Dimitri in the original, but those are at least three characters that stand out to me that came back for the reimagining, albeit as different characters. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know, I think they realized at a certain point that they shouldn't just turn their backs on the original series, that that was maybe kind of cutting off their nose to spite their face. And so they thought, hey, what if we bring back some of these actors that the original fan base would recognize and have some relationship to, even if they're not the exact same characters? So... At some point, I think they kind of woke up to, you know, you don't want to you don't want to push those people away. You at least want to give them some entry into the show if possible. So I think they kind of got, you know, a little more. How should I say? Uh, they embraced nostalgia a little bit more. or Yeah, I, I think, I, I think they, they stopped worrying about this has to be totally different and totally new from whatever was done before. And they recognized that. You know, we owe something to that legacy. Why? Why are we turn? You know, why are we ignoring it? Maybe we should find some way to embrace it. And I thought that was a wise move on their part. Actually. And so when the Save MacGyver, so the show gets canceled after five years, five pretty strong years, and I believe the ratings were were very solid, airing mostly on Friday nights, I believe. And uh, the show gets canceled, but then this huge Save MacGyver movement takes off. Uh, on Twitter and social media, you know, millions of paper clips being sent, and you kind of, do you just kind of get caught up in that by proxy, or did that surprise you? What was your take on the whole Save MacGyver movement and how that affected you going forward? I, I was blown away, to be perfectly honest, because I had no idea that there was this really motivated new fan base for this show, so much so that they really put a lot of time and energy and I met and the the cadre of people who really ran this were all women and they were women in their mid 20s to you know to their late 40s and some had science backgrounds and some were you know uh, journalists and some were graphic designers and it was just they just kind of coalesced around we love this show and we don't want you to stop making this show and I was, I was flabbergasted and amazed and said, if I can help in any way, I'm happy to help. I don't know that it's going to do us any good <laughs> because my analysis of the situation, having been in Hollywood for as long as I was, was that, yeah, I don't, I can see the, the, both the financial political reasons why this probably isn't going to happen, but you know, you, if I can pitch in and help, I'm happy to help. And then, then they started doing charitable things. Let's give some money to cancer. Let's do a blood drive. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm all in on that. Anything I can do to help. You're turning MacGyver into let's do something positive for the world. It's like, I'm there. I'm there. So I helped and they're still going. I still don't know that it's going to get where they want it to go. But, you know, who knows? 
I, I think the I think the hard part for a show like that that has such a passionate fan base is that it unceremoniously ended. It's not like, hey, we're this is going to be the last season and you can tie up storylines. Or, ironically enough, another George Eads vehicle when the original CSI was canceled, it just kind of got canceled. Now they did do a uh, like a TV movie to sort of wrap up CSI maybe ten years ago, but. Maybe for the Save MacGyver fans, that can at least be their hope, is one one last two-hour run to tie up some storylines and, uh, and and bring some closure to their beloved series. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know why it got canceled. Uh, I honestly don't know why it got canceled. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that they had about 100 episodes, which is what distribution needs, okay? And it had started under a different administration at CBS, so, you know, you're now running CBS and you go, well, the show is just doing OK. Distribution says they have everything that they need. Another season isn't going to significantly increase the distribution value of it. And I'm not getting any credit because the last administration put this show on. So why don't I see if I can come up with something and that'll work just as well, if not better. And then I can take credit for it, you know, and so... And it's like, oh, we could put it on Paramount Plus or, you know, whatever. You know, they just, it's a its a series of, I think, career, financial, political considerations that go into that decision. Um, and rather than saying, yeah, you know, let's just do a, one more TV movie to tie everything up and make the fans happy. It was like, nah, we're done with the show. Next. Yeah. And they didn't, I think they didn't realize that, wait a minute, you've kind of left us all hanging. That's not fair. That's not nice. And obviously outpourings from other, uh, you know, from fans on other shows have produced uh, other networks or streaming services to step in and say, okay, we'll continue this series because there's obviously an audience for it. But for whatever reason, that so far hasn't happened for MacGyver. Maybe it still will. I I honestly can't say. Lee, we have uh, two more legit questions for you, kind of wrap-up questions. But before that, if we could just throw a, a quick, like, rapid fire at you. So you can just give us a word. You can give us a no comment. Two, three words, whatever. We'll get a little fun here. So we'll, me and Michael trade off. So I'll go first. Just quick, you know, word association here. Lee Davis Lodoff. Mullets. Love them. <laughs> Swiss Army Knives. Gotta have it. Uh, McGruber. Not as funny as it could be. If MacGyver is a 10 on the science-centric handyman scale, what are you? Uh, about a five and a half. Uh, favorite all-time movie? <sighs> Lawrence of Arabia. Favorite all-time TV show? MacGyver. I mean, what am I supposed to say? Right? Come on. It's <laughs> like, you know, it's my child. What do you want me to say? I, I love somebody else's child more? That's unfair. I'm sorry. You should withdraw that question. <laughs> um, you got a favorite sports team? You know, I love to watch sports. I don't identify with any teams, maybe because I just know too much about it. Most teams are owned by rich white guys, okay? And and I appreciate that people fall in love with their local team, but as Jerry Seinfeld once brilliantly did in a comedy routine, he says, let's face it, you're rooting for the uniforms, okay? Because the guys come and go, you know? And, uh, you know, and it's like, so I understand why people love sports. I, I think it's fabulous. There's all this fan, you know, fantasy sports, betting on sports. Knock yourselves out. But to me, it's like, it's a game. All due respect, it's a game. You know, it looks like real life. It's not real life. It'd be nice if we honored engineers and scientists the way we honor sports figures. Okay, but we don't. So, you know, favorite musical artist or group? What do you listen to? Wow. Well, I'm, you know, Crosby, Stills and Nash, you know, uh, um, Cream. I mean, I, I came up in that whole period and I still listen to and love that music. I listen to a lot of new music. I mean, I listen to Coldplay and I listen to, you know, um, Counting Crows. And I mean, but, but. I was a, you know, a kid of the 60s, man, and that stuff just stays with you. Listen to a lot of Beatles. How can you not listen to a lot of Beatles? They were geniuses, you know? Bob Dylan. I mean, it's, yeah. Uh, favorite food? Sushi. 
Okay. Favorite person you've worked with? Wow. Favorite person I've worked with? Hmm. Pierce Brosnan was was a scholar and a gentleman. I gotta say, he was a first-rate human being. I mean, he did his job, but but he was a first-rate human being. And I've worked with a lot of wonderful people, but most most of you wouldn't know who they were, what their names were. So, but in terms of you know day to day having to work with a professional, he was pretty spectacular. That, that wraps up the uh, the bone the, uh, the you know, rapid, rapid fire. fire? Rapid it. fire. <laughs> How many points? We can keep going. Throw? We'll make them up. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Um, yeah, but so what's next for you? What's next for Lee Davis Lodoff? What's next for MacGyver? And how are those two intertwined? Okay, so obviously the musical is going to keep going on. As I said, we're going to start trying to put together a concept album, and we're going to look to do start doing you know more productions uh, of the musical. So that'll probably be with me for you know, easily the next five years until either it goes away or I got to hand it off to somebody else and say, I got to get home with the rest of my life. Uh, I'm working on a really exciting feature film at the moment, which I don't want to go into any detail about. Uh, I've got uh, the next MacGyver fiction book is coming out. We're also working on a new version of the MacGyver secret for veterans, uh, first responders and their families that I think could be helpful to them because they've been through a very heavy duty time. Um, and leaving the military is turns out not an easy thing to do. Um, it comes with a lot of challenges. Uh, every one, every one out of three or one out of four homeless people is a veteran. That tells us something, okay? Um, we're not helping them get back into society in the way that we should if one out of every three or four homeless people is a veteran. Um, so I would like to try and use the MacGyver Secret to help those people and, and you know, professional first responders, doctors, nurses, EMTs, uh, who have been having really a very rough time with this pandemic. I mean, the burnout is significant, you know, and you don't need me to tell you that. Um, so that's uh, in, in the pipeline. Um, I have a, a big historical epic that I'm working on. That will be a series of three books. Uh, don't know when that's coming out, but, but you know, um, that that's in the pipeline as well. And, you know, and we're working on a MacGyver VR experience, um, which uh, could be a game, could be something that uh, ties into the musical in some way. So, um, so that's kind of what's going on in my life. I'm, I'm like, as I said, I'm just sort of crazy busy, but that's by choice. You know, I love what I do. I love making things. I love making things physically. You know, I build things around the house. I just built this, rock memorial in my backyard to the pandemic it's called a cairn you know it's a, like it looks like a giant egg made out of rocks it's about eight feet high and six feet in diameter it's because i needed to make the pandemic physical to me in some way i went I, I read in the newspaper i look listen on television these are just numbers how many people get sick how many people are dying how many people are suffering and it's like i gotta i gotta do something that that acknowledges that pain and suffering and I get blisters and my face gets sunburned and my back hurts and you know all that kind of stuff but it's got to be I got to make it real at least for me um, so I like doing that but I love telling stories I mean that's what I am I'm a storyteller you know you could call me writer producer director those are just fancy names for storytellers so I'm a professional storyteller until you know I keel over hopefully I'll keep telling stories So cool to to hear all of that, and and maybe we can, if if you're willing to share the picture of your um, rock memorial that you've built, I'm I'm sure, sure. we could share that out through mm. our social media channels as well. I'm um, happy to send you a picture. <laughs> send us a picture of some rocks, please. But clearly, <laughs> it, it, it has a story. So let me let me ask you this, and this is a question I I just added to our hit list here. But um, sure. so many like the Comic Con thing or the pop culture events have have become such a big deal 
in the last 15 years or so, but there are so few shows that have the staying power that a MacGyver does. You know, MASH still has that staying power, the Dukes of Hazard, even though politically it's kind of fallen out of favor. But has there been thought to any kind of reunion for MacGyver, the cast, the, the, the production crew, etc., since you are coming up on 40 years? It's not all that far into the future. Well, the answer is, you know, Paramount, now CBS um, really owns the rights to the original television series and to the new TV series. So that would have to be their call. Um, I mean, I've we've had some scattered conversations about a MacGyver reality show, which conceivably could be a lot of fun, um, but they've never seemed to want to kind of pick up the ball and run with it. And I'm okay with that too. Uh, I think a reunion show would would be great and cool, but that's not my call. That's their call. Um, and and um, all I can do is sort of take MacGyver and move it forward. And and to me now, you go to the website, MacGyver.com, and it says right at the top of the website, there's a MacGyver in everyone, and anyone can be a MacGyver. So for me, it's not about a TV series anymore. I understand that's your, where your love of it came from, and believe me, I've been all over the world, and I know how MacGyver has touched people. It's not just another TV show. It's really touched them on some level because I think it resonates with the way they have to struggle to make their lives work as well, okay? And, and I think that is a powerful and potentially world-changing vibe, all right? Um, and so I want to... Encourage that vibe. Speak to that vibe. If it makes money, great. That's mostly to satisfy my financial investors because they give me the money to do projects with it because they want to make money. But for me, it's not really about the money. For me, it's about people. We have capabilities that we don't appreciate. We have resources at our disposal that we don't appreciate. You can change your life. We can change this planet. You just have to start believing that, okay? It's step one is saying, I believe that. Now, how do I do that? When do I do that? What do I do? But but that's, you know, I've got four grown children. I've got four grandchildren. A lot of other people have grandchildren out there. I don't want them to be facing a calamity, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 years from now because we just couldn't get our act together to start addressing these problems. So to me, MacGyver is like, if I can remind you of a something you loved, enjoyed, had fun with, okay, and at the same time say, remember, you have these capabilities. We are not victims of our circumstances. We are masters of our own fate. First, you got to accept that that's the case, and then you can get about making the world a better place. That's why I do it, and that's what gets me up every morning. And I'm not going to stop until they either lock me away or I keel over. Lee, you, you have a lot to be proud of, and it's a, it's a great legacy you're leaving behind, and especially in this last 10, 15 years, and especially in this last five years with this whole, you know, turn towards compassion and, and, and you know, dignity and, and your fellow man. And so we notice it. It's clearly, you know, priority one maybe for you at this point, but uh, congratulations on doing that. And, um, uh, and, you know, when you think about it, Lee, uh, we're quite similar. Um, you're from New York. I'm from New York. You created MacGyver. I created making fun of MacGyver. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you like sushi. I like sushi. I mean, just what I'm saying here, I guess, is if you ever want to team up, I think, give me a call. Give old Sam here uh, a call. You could be a brother from another mother. What can I say, <laughs> you know? I guess, Lee, before we wrap this up, do you have any questions for us? We've been talking at you for almost an hour. Do you have any questions for me or Sam? Well, like I said, my purpose on coming here and, and sharing what I have with you is, is to prompt you to change the name of your show to having fun with MacGyver as opposed to making <laughs> fun of MacGyver. But, you know, that's in your hands, guys. There's nothing I can do about that. You know, it's, it's uh, your choice. And uh, I'm sure the world will survive either way. But, uh, but you know, if you're going to make fun of MacGyver, just do it well. Appealing to the better angels uh, at every step. Lee David's load up, right? Lee, thank you so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure talking to you today. Great. Thanks, guys. Take care. 
How cool was that, Sam? I mean, it was great that Lee gave us the time that he did. He played along with our shenanigans. He, uh, he might want us to change the name of the podcast, but having fun with Mac- <laughs> something like that. I, I think maybe we can maybe we can win him over and get him to where we are versus the other way around. But in all seriousness, I mean that story about how the character was named. You can't you can't just call him Guy. Hey, our guy here, our guy there, and it makes total sense. You think about that Mac branding in the eighties, from Mac cards to Big Macs to you know, McDonald's. Everything was, you know, Mac computers. So cool. Why not? Let's call him MacGyver. So uh, great stories and a cool sense of humor and the patience of a saint dealing with our nonsense. You know what really came through for me in that interview? Hearing how he got his start was just like a lot of gumption, like a lot of ingenuity, right? Like that job as the temp or the, the secretary. You know what? Let me, I can do a better script. Let me do this. Let me, let me send letters to this person. Let, like, you know, I wish I could go back 30 years ago and do some of that stuff, but kudos to him. That's how you get to be someone like that a lot of times is nose to the grindstone and took chances and just got in people's faces and said, here, let me try. Let me do this and didn't really get ever stagnant. And um, and then eventually you land. Well, he did land on a gold mine of MacGyver. Well, and I mean, how about the cubes on that dude? The fact that he was able to uh, he he really went all in on himself. He bet on himself. From that initial, I can write that better than the current people with the mindset of, well, if the worst that's going to happen is they're going to fire me. Maybe the best that happens is they, they like my copy. So he, he took a chance on himself and it paid off. And I think we all feel better when they say don't meet your heroes. And I don't know if we could say he's a hero, right? We haven't always looked at we, the name just kind of popped on our zeitgeist in the last few years. However, he created a character that is pretty near and dear to us and millions of other people. So, you know, like that's semi hero ish and they say, don't meet your heroes, but I think we all feel better moving forward knowing that he was a good guy. Right. And now we can gladly talk about this property that's got his name attached to it going forward because yeah, he was so friendly and a warm person with a good heart. And I feel even better now about investing this time in this silly podcast. Well, and, and I have, I've shared stories, but I've met so many people over the years and Nine times out of 10, they deliver. They were, to me, what I hoped they would be. There are those few that leave you scratching your head or wish you never would have seen behind the curtain. But this is, as you said, one of those ones where he was as advertised, so to speak, and we can walk away from this happy. And just like we refer to Bruce McGill as friend of the show, Lee David Zlodoff, now friend of the show. That's great. And thank you again, Lee. Um, And thank you to Rosie for helping to set up the interview. Any final words uh, on this episode, Mike, on this big 50th? No, I mean, happy uh, happy birthday making fun of MacGyver. We're we're halfway to the century mark. In another two years, we'll we'll hit episode 100 or something like that. But it's it's pretty cool. I never thought we would have gotten to 50 episodes, you know, a year and a half ago when we started this. And uh, it's pretty cool that we've made it this far. And hopefully we can keep going. And to punctuate it with uh, Lee Davis Lodoff is just great. So thank you, Mike. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you for listening out there. Uh, We really appreciate it a lot. A gracious hat tip to our Patreon patrons. That's Mia Norris, who wants to remind us about the importance of being an organ donor. And Bo Rigby, who reminds us that making people smile has a real world impact. Hey, we're always hunting for new friends. So please say hi to us on the social media. Send us an email. Check us out on Patreon. Give us a call at 904-419-3310. Anything. We just love chatting with new people and uh, above all else though keep coming back because we are going to keep making fun of MacGyver so for Mike and Jeff I'm Sam thanks again and we'll see you next time peace It's just that ginger ale is really best over shaved ice, not cubes. These are cubes.